uh, in a couple of minutes, just awaiting one of the ministers to arrive. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, um, I'm very excited to be here today. Um, this is Infrastructure Day at the COP28 in Dubai, and we are here to talk about coastal adaptation, coastal adaptation to sea level rise. So here we're here to talk about a lot of our cities across the world that are facing the impacts of climate change. And we have a fantastic panel that will be with us very shortly. Um, first of all, I am Lorelai Picot, I'm the executive director of the Ocean and Climate Platform. For those who don't know us, uh, first of all, that's really weird because we were created for the very purpose of getting the ocean into the climate discussions. So this is a little bit of our uh, a prom for us, uh, the, the Climate Cup every year. I say that with a lot of uh, humor, obviously, but we're not here to joke around, obviously. And these are some very serious topics that we will be discussing today. And allow me, before we uh, dive into this very concrete and important discussion, to thank our partners. First of all, our home away from home, the Ocean Pavilion. Uh, it's the second year in a row that we have now an Ocean Pavilion in the, in the Blue Zone, and we're very excited to be hosting this, uh, this event here and our colleagues and partners for this uh, event, the Global Fund for Cities Development, the Secretariat of the Pacific Regional Environment Program, and the Pacific Climate Change Center that have been working with the Ocean and Climate Platform to get this event together today. So to give you a little bit of context, about four years ago, after the um, IPCC report on ocean and the cryosphere, we thought, okay, there is a huge challenge coming our way that is being largely overlooked, the impacts of sea level rise. And although we know that, you know, in case some of you have missed it, uh, climate change is proven by science, we do need to reduce drastically our greenhouse gas emissions, but some of the impacts will be irreversible. And when it comes to sea level rise, it is accelerating, it is a global phenomenon, 
And most importantly, it will not stop. So we need to adapt. We need to develop those solutions. We need to understand also the rational in different regions of the world to avoid maladaptation. We need to ensure that social justice is very much at the heart of all of the strategies that we're pulling together. And since we're at COP28, we also need to understand how global frameworks such as the Climate Convention can accelerate our response, our global response to climate change. And when we talk about COP28, on the very first day, we launch the, adapt the loss and damage fund. How can we make sure that our responses to sea level rise will also be included in this fund? How can we make sure that we don't overlook the impacts in the global goal for adaptation? How do we make sure that the global stock take also takes into account those responses? So for the delegates in the room, you have a lot of work ahead, but we're also here to support. So it is really my utmost pleasure to be uh, your master of ceremony today. And I also want to welcome and, and thank all of the people joining us online, including uh, our colleagues of the platform that are based in Paris and woke up really early to make sure that they wouldn't miss this event and to kick Ooh, to kickstart this discussion, it is my pleasure to welcome one of the big ocean states, one of the leaders when it comes to promoting ocean and climate um, action throughout the world. And I believe, um, Your Excellency, that in Seychelles, you've also launched the Coastal Management Plan. So it is really an honor to have you with us today. And uh, Excellency, Mr. Billy Hangazam, you're the Minister of Land and Housing, and you will be delivering the first uh, keynote speech today. So please, the floor is yours. I've been sprinting. <laughs> Sorry. Welcome to Expo Society. Yeah. <laughs> In a suit as well, it doesn't help. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Good morning. Are we all here? Excellent, excellent. Uh, thank you for this wonderful introduction, MC. And uh, it's a pleasure to be with you. And it's quite fitting that we are in Ocean Pavilion today, um, within Blue Zone and also close to Green Zone, to see how the two, the oceans and our, and our dear coastal areas, um, our motherland, the physical land where we, where we are all staying and, uh, and uh, appreciating is and has to be interlinked and work together in, a, in order for us to address all these coastal challenges that we are facing. So without further ado, I'd like to follow the protocol and uh, welcome all the distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, all the protocols observed. And I wish you all a good morning again. Bonjour, salam alaikum. <laughs> As a small island state, seeds, Seychelles, like most of the countries represented here today, really relies heavily on its coastal areas for economic development, critical infrastructure, and housing. Though most of our popu populated islands are granitic in the Seychelles and therefore have elevated regions, due to technical challenges in developing these areas, as well as the need to protect our natural environment, almost 90% of the population and core primary infrastructure is concentrated in the narrow coastal plains. Additionally, almost two thirds of our islands are coralline. That's 71 islands out of 115 islands, and therefore flat, and are highly susceptible to any degree of sea level rise and extreme tidal episodes. Although these islands are not the most populous, they play a significant role in our economic activities through our tourism sector and environmental activities as a research centers. We have the Ald Aldebra Atoll, for example. These are uh, they're literally research, research centers um, in the area of ocean oceanography, etc. Consequently, the livelihood of the majority of our people is at stake when we talk about climate change and more particularly sea level rise. As small island developing states, we continue to face the common challenge of the cost of making our countries more climate resilient 
through various climate adaptation measures. It is a, a serious challenge, to be honest with you. In his intervention last week, the Honorable President of Seychelles, Mr. Wevel Ramkalawan, indicated that the potential cost of $600 million would be needed over the next 10 years to allow Seychelles to overcome this challenge. 600 million US dollars. For a small country like the Seychelles, this represents 140% of our current annual infrastructure budget. So presently, if you, if you, if what I'm trying to say, it's about 1.4 times the present budget that we have just to actually build our infrastructure. Now we've got to find 140% of that to, to try and deal with this issue of climate, uh, climate change and, and uh, adaptation measures, etc. The last major single disaster event that we experienced caused economic damage of over 3% of our annual GDP. Unfortunately, we do not have the financial capacity and technical expertise to address these problems in a timely manner <laughs> to protect the scarce developable, developable, developable land that we have. It is really scarce because it's, it's just the narrow coastal strip. We've got reclaimed areas as well as, well as those Coraline Islands. In 2019, the government of Seychelles developed the first, like you pointed out, MC, the first national coastal management plan to address coastal flooding, erosion, and ecosystem degradation at several priority sites around the country. The plan delineates strategic investments and institutional capacity building, technical capacity building on coastal adaptation. We now just need the resources to implement this plan. Dear friends, aside from these threats that have been well documented, I'm sure in all our respective countries, I was just sharing with you the Seychelles experience, we also face ecological threats to our biodiversity and our natural environment. Very serious ones, actually. Seychelles, for example, despite all our efforts, has experienced widespread coral bleaching events in the past two, de two decades due to the increase in sea temperature that has eradicated, I repeat, eradicated almost 90% of the live coral cover around our most populous islands. We must remember that although our countries may be separated by thousands of kilometers, and even in different oceans, we are all connected and suffer the same impacts regardless of which side of the world we may be. It is also vital to put forward in this forum that as SEEDS, the complexity of our situation is exaggerated by the fact that it is difficult to make the distinction between urban and rural areas because of the size of our countries means that because of typically islands, for example, in our case, and most of us uh, on the coastal uh, areas as well, we know we have cities as well, but, but those islands, the sheer size that they have means that the vast majority of the land mass is being utilized and is therefore susceptible to impacts of climate change. To echo our honorable president of the Seychelles, whether we are a high income, a low income, or among the least developed countries, our specificities are the same. And what the industrialized nations emit have a direct impact on our coastlines and livelihoods. I repeat, our livelihoods. And we must therefore unite and support each other. He has also asked for the financial, financial support of the whole world, and it is now up to us as the most affected countries to make our voices count louder than our size. As you pointed out, Seychelles has endorsed the COP28 presidency CHAMP initiative that was launched at the beginning of COP28 together with 64 uh, other countries. We are also part of the Alliance of African Ministers for Urban Development Financing, AMUF, and together with my 23 peers of the continent, 
we we launched a few minutes ago uh, uh, in the uh, in the ministerial uh, meeting that we had an urban opportunity to fast forward uh, this initiative, UFI, to promote to provide us with the financial engineering required to innovate and better access the available, uh, available range of funding and financing. This is only to say that we are doing our best on our side to convert, conserve and protect this beautiful environment that we have, especially the blessing that we have from, from the almighty, our dear Seychelles. And we should take the advantage of all opportunities we meet on our challenging and urging road to resilience. I see that the UN Ocean Conference and the Cities Platform, it's really beautiful, the Cities Platform, has other promising features, but again, we need each other and we need you. To conclude, unity is our strength. We are all in this together and we must leave no one behind. We must engage our youth. We must empower our youth also. May the Almighty bless and guide us. Thank you, everyone, for your attention. I wish you a great deliberation this morning. Thank you. Not at all, not at all, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, um, Excellency, for your inspiring words and reminding us that indeed the ocean connects us all. And it's a message of hope, it's a message of unity, and we desperately need that message as well here at Cap 28. So thank you very much for all that you're doing. We know you're extremely busy, but I will invite the panelists to join us on, on stage and our uh, next moderator as well to take a quick picture and then back to business. Yes? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We feel always very... Okay. Stay in your chest. So now we'll dive into a more in-depth conversation that will be moderated by our fantastic Théophile Bangasleb, the director of the Cities Initiative that will lead this discussion on better understanding how to adapt to sea level rise in different regions of the world. Théophile, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. <laughs> Hello, everyone. It's my great pleasure to moderate this, uh, this panel. Thank you very much, Excellency. So before we jump in the panel discussion, I just want to introduce the Cities uh, Initiative that we launched four years ago. Uh, the Ocean and Climate Platform decided to dedicate one special program to sea level rise and the adaptation of coastal cities. So we had first one year of scientific work to understand with a multidisciplinary point of view and understanding what can be a sustainable future for coastal cities adaptation. And in a second time, we organized a series of different workshops. And here are the different regions where we had this specific focus, gathering both uh, mayors and elected representatives from coastal cities, scientists, but also a network of experts that have already been or, uh, implementing concrete actions on the ground. Now we are a network of more than 230 experts who were mobilized during those different uh, workshops. And so what we have been trying to do recently is to uh, propose some recommendations that we identified. And we had four main challenges. One on solution, which solution we need concretely, what is effective, social justice, how to include social justice in the design of coastal adaptation strategy, knowledge, concretely which kind of science and knowledge we need, and finally, finance. So it will be today the objective of the discussion and the role of our panelists but to un underline why it is important and also to show us how in their daily work they are already trying to address those different challenges. Just before we start, uh, I, want to, uh, I want us to have in mind that in 2025, in Nice, uh, the UNOC conference, uh, 
will be hosted by the city of Nice, and a coalition of coastal city will be launched. Uh, and it will be based on the city's initiative and on the different challenges that are here identified. So I hope that uh, this discussion can guide us in the thinking and designing of uh, this coalition and uh, ensure that the specific needs of coastal cities can be addressed. So uh, we'll start with uh, Karina von Schuchmann. Thank you very much for being with us. Uh, Karina, you work with uh, Mercator Ocean International, and you have been leading different uh, scientific work with the IPCC, the SROC, Specific Program on Ocean and Cryosphere. Goodbye, Mr. Minister. <laughs> the SROC, you worked also uh, with IOC, with WMO, so you are here representing the scientific community with us today. So one brief question. Can you tell us what the research community propose as new way today to meet those different challenges. The floor is yours. Thank you very much for the uh, opportunity to bring in some science knowledge into this discussion on uh, sea level rise. So I will provide um, information in, from uh, drawing from uh, two IPCC reports, or R6, on the working group one, which is a physical science basis, and working group two on the adaptation and societal relevance. So uh, where we are today with sea level rise, today we have observed since 19, the beginning 1900, uh, a sea level rise of zero to meter um, on global average. And uh, what is projected um, is projected is for the next, uh, um, if we go through a 1.5 degree scenario, we will reach up uh, two meters of global sea level rise for the next two uh, millennia and it will be higher for other choices uh, we might pass through. So, um, so we also know that uh, sea level rise has accelerated. So it's one of the single climate indicators where acceleration has been quantified in scientific publications. So, um, so this continued sea level rise and also the acceleration aspect will continue to encroach the coastal areas and, of course, then with it, uh, the cities across. And so it poses a distinctive and severe adaptation challenge. So why is this so? First, it, it's a low, slow emerging change on the one hand. And on the other hand, there's also this increase on the frequency and also on the intensity of extreme sea level events. So um, what we need to do? course is to reduce the impact and to take the best adaptation measures. So I will provide here those solutions which had been assessed in the Working Group 2 uh, report. And so uh, the responses to ongoing sea level rise and um, the sun subsidence, they include four major aspects. So first is the protection, it's the accommodation, it's uh, the relocation, planned relocation, and it's also uh, the advance, so-called advance. And um, so what also has been said um, is important because it has been said that responses to sea level rise are then most effective if there's a combined adaptation planning, it's a sequenced, if it's fully planned, and well ahead. Because again, we are talking about a long, slow emerging change. And it's, it should be aligned with sociocultural values and also with the regional develop, development uh, priorities and also underpinned by inclusive community engagement processes to uh, fully adapt also to the needs at uh, the specific areas. So um, what has been also assessed uh, is important that the societal choices and the actions implemented in the next deca decade determine determine the extent um, which uh, the pathways will deliver in terms of, of the adaptation pathway chosen. So um, another aspect and which is coming back to one of the major components on the long-term emergent change and also uh, on the well planning which has been also uh, put ahead <coughs> is that the adaptation capacity and the governance to manage the risks of sea level rise typically, typically requires decades to be implemented and also um, to, in, 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 to institutionalize. So it's not only the implementation, it's also the aspect of institutionalization. 
And so the future of the coast depends on immediate mitigation, but also on the adaptation strategy. So it's both. One has to mitigate to limit the rates of sea level rise, even if it's committed. But that means we would gain more time to develop those long-term planning strategies for sea level rise. And then adaptation, as mentioned before, and in terms also to um, impacts of sea level rise, like the flooding, the erosion, and also salinization, particularly uh, on the islands. And uh, while implementing the climate policies, um, there's more resilient coastal environments which should be created in terms of uh, this aspect. So in summary, coastal adaptation is essential in adaptation in addition to adaptation and mitigation. And we need to start planning now and uh, also to uh, accept uncertainty and to think on short and long-term aspects for these adaptation strategies and recognize the choices we face on the diverse pathways we might follow. And uh, here's a thinking, thinking uh, point in terms of what next, what could be the solution to work on. Um, so uh, one vision which has been shared um, uh, from some time scientists is a shared vision to think about the development of a shared vision for coastal areas with respect to uh, the aspect of sea level rise. And they have put ahead five main um, solution aspects to prepare the ground for adaptation, to prioritize long-lived assessed and infrastructures, to assess adaptation options, to implement adaptation, and to monitor the adaptation progress. So I just want to finalize with uh, one clear message on the scientific knowledge coming back to working group one. And that is uh, that sea level rise, because it englobes two of uh, the earth system components, which uh, have a, a long inertia that is the deep ocean warming, and that is the melt of uh, ice sheets, uh, mean that sea level is a committed change for a long time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Von Schuchman, for the summary of the, of the IPCC, but also underlying the, the uncertainty. And, and that's very difficult to deal when we are trying to implement solutions to deal with uncertainty. So uh, now, uh, Karim Selwan, or doctor, I can also say doctor uh, Selwan, you are the CEO and the founder of uh, Resilience. And you're also a member of the steering committee of the Global Alliance for Building and Construction. So we'll talk about construction and concrete solution also. Uh, Karim, uh, you know that for years, the reflex to face sea level rise has been to protect ourselves and to build dikes. But sometimes it's not the only solution and it has some limits. So can you tell us what is your vision of what is a sustainable adaptation solution? Okay, this is a very complex answer, a complex question because uh, it's impossible to say that there is one solution, impossible, it's not pertinent, it's not relevant. The question is how we could make, how we could design a specific for the local context, very important, that's why the global ABC. We launched during the COP26 the 10 principles for effective actions dedicated to accelerate the adaptation action for the building and construction sectors. And the question is not to, uh, to determine how we could build. The question is which question do you do so to anticipate the most design for your adaptation solution. And this 10 principle is absolutely clear. That's why we use the term of principle, not regulation. This is not a mathematical or physical uh, uh, solution. This is principle, very specific, uh, because you know that the term is very important, how you, uh, which definition the, you need to use. First, urgency, because we need to act now, okay? Not tomorrow, now. The second point, it is the stakeholders. Very important to have, uh, to, to discuss with all the stakeholders with a systemic approach, not only with the systemic infrastructure, with the uh, uh, interlink on the, or the connection between all the infrastructure, also how you could onboard with you all the stakeholders, the, 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 the policy maker, engineer, practitioner, financial institution, the, the NGO, et cetera, et cetera. The process, consider the adaptation along the entire life cycle of infrastructure, very important, because you are the design phase, construction phase, maintenance phase, but after also the rehabilitation, the renovation phase, et cetera. Don't we, you need to project your infrastructure during a long period with this different scenarios, uh, uh, predictive uh, uh, model, for example. Mitigation, as you said, we need to make in the tandem mitigation and adaptation each time. This is not the two opposite term. Opposite is 
not relevant adaptation and mitigation in the tandem each time. The data, very important because we are speaking about the knowledge. The question is how we could have an access of the relevant data, which data you, uh, is, it could be important notably to understand the climate risk data and the accept of uncertainty. The question of the scale, which scale do you, uh, it should be uh, used to design the best adaptation solution, local, city scale, neighborhood scale, uh, island scale, regional scale, national scale, all depend the type of infrastructure because it will depend the use of your infrastructure. For example, a road, uh, uh, highways or the uh, highways infrastructure, you need to have a very large scale, not the same for the, uh, for the building uh, scale, for example. The green solution, for example, to use more and more the nature-based solution or some the green solution, or some, some hybrid solution also, all depend your capacity. Uh, or the local context, the people to promote the just adaptation of the building sector because this is not a question for the rich or the poor. It's a, it should be a very universal solution to adaptation. That's why in the end you need to ask the question of we want to share the risk, we want to share the, the, the finance solution. We promote and we try to find a new type of uh, financial mechanism to support not only for the global south. We want to pay, we want to support. This is a question of loss and damage, for example, for the responsibility. That's why I jump in the question of the nine principles, the finance enable adaptation of the building sector. And the last one, this is a local solution. Fit adaptation measure for the local context, very important for us. And it, this 10 principle for effective action now is tested. Uh, we are testing the 10 principle in a lot of international projects, notably in Bahamas. Island and uh, in the Dominic Island with the IFC, International Finance Corporation. We want to uh, develop some knowledge platform to modelize several scenarios of stress tests to see how the climate change could impact one infrastructure or how one infrastructure could have a domino effect with the other infrastructure to have a very global vision to estimate with the best quantity or the best indicator the cost of the investments and after to establish the most uh, financial mechanism to support the adaptation during a long vision. This is what we are doing now, uh, notably with the IFC, for example. Thank you very much, Karim. Thank you. Thank you also for sharing a concrete uh, examples. And so we will have to go and, and to dig a bit on what, what has been done in uh, Dominica. Uh, so, after science uh, solutions, we have to talk about human, maybe, also. And so uh, thank you, uh, Honorable Miss, Mrs. Uh, Ainu, for being uh, with us. It's an honor to have you here. Uh, you are the Minister of Natural Resources and Environment of New Way. And you are also the Regional Pacific Political Champions for Gender and Social Inclusion. So. Um, we know that sea level rise will affect the whole organization of some societies, especially in the Pacific uh, large ocean states. And uh, it will also modify the relationship the community can have with the sea. So uh, we are pleased to hear you and ex explain you how we can include those uh, considerations in the design of policy adaptation. Thank you and bonjour. bonjour. Uh, from the uh, vibrant, beautiful blue Pacific, and the Daughters of the Deep. So Daughters of the Deep uh, is a program that we're part of to uh, teach our young girls and, um, and some of our honorary girls, which are, of course, boys, um, the life under the deep blue ocean, which is where we live. So anyway, from the Pacific. Well, I hear the science. I hear the financial solutions and what is expected of us. But reality for us is we're sinking. Absolutely sinking. And there is no way, I spoke this morning about us being in the ocean. We can't drive into another land. Basically, this is it. I come from an island, there's just one. One island in the blue Pacific. So when we talk about uh, coastal development, in 2008, my island created a policy, uh, a coastal policy, and this includes also um, the restrictions by the government to not uh, construct 
infrastructure along the coastal area because this is, these are predictions we've had for many, many years because we're seeing an intense um, climate impact and the stress it's having on our people. So we created all these programs, but firstly, I wanted from the, uh, the regional, the Pacific region's uh, perspective and, and three key areas or key messages that, w that we wish to, um, to amplify at COP. And basically, first is to avoid maladaptation. These, um, in particular, protecting and maintaining the livelihoods of the most vulnerable. What has happened in the Pacific over the years is that with sea level rise, a lot of the islands are submerged. A lot of areas are disconnected from where we normally live. So for us, in order for us to live, we've had to relocate somewhere else. But this, of course, costs a lot of money. It stresses government's um, uh, appropriation of budget, which we don't have. We rely heavily on others and, and development partners and dialogue partners to, to help us. So these are some of the things that we have had to come and, and try to work with our communities. We have programs for our children uh, so they understand the impacts and, and what is going to happen uh, year on. But for decades, we've, we've had this conversation. Um, and of course, if you're impacted, you, you, you lose employment, you have issues with health. You know, some of the islands that we have traveled to as a champion, it really breaks my heart because I'm a mother and I'm seeing some of these families being displaced. They live in a small space of 60,000 people. They live with their animals because there's no space to live. This is reality for us. Reality for us is really we need the global community to understand and urgently help us. And so secondly, the center um, social justice into the coastal adaptation. Um, we have had also to come up with innovative ideas to help us fund and uh, allow us to build on some of the um, policies, you know, our infrastructural um, issues that have come up along the coast because we want to have, we want to live, our children want to live in a, in a place uh, into the future that they are comfortable with because we're losing a lot. We're, we're losing tradition. We're losing where we used to live. Um, and so we are having to create um, ideas. And so where I come from, teaching children at an early age to adapt from five years old to 10 years old. This is when they come from primary. There's a huge campaign a few years back that we started to allow them to expose them to what we're talking about. We hear about the science. Half of the time, I don't know what science terms mean. So the language has to be adaptable and relevant to our own people. So these are some of the things that have really challenged us. So exposing all our children, giving them ideas to, to how to live, how to, what to expect, to feel, to think, to, to experience what you know, what is reality for us in the Pacific. These are some of the things that have come up. We've come up with, with an innovative idea for financing. I'm, I'm sure my finance friend here uh, will appreciate it, um, called the Ocean Conservation Commitment, where we have taken away from our coast and invested in creating a marine protected area within our um, exclusive economic zone by committing 40% of our EEZ, our ocean real estate, as marine protected area. Um, and this we launched in New York. But these are some of the things that we are hoping that um, if you're interested in, in committing, uh, it's a 20 year program that we have to protect, monitor uh, surveillance on our EEZ. Um, if you're interested, I have a team over there that will um, guide you to where we're supposed to be uh, talking about this, this uh, mechanism that we had for funding. Um, so we are able to help our people, help the infrastructure and the coast, help our children to understand what it is, how long they have on this earth to build something uh, better for themselves. Uh, because we owe it to our ancestors. They brought us up in a place that is so beautiful and so blue. We wanted to exist for many, many years to go. Because for generations, we've lived in fear. We lived in places where we are seeing places that are not there anymore, islands that have submerged, it's just really difficult. And as mothers, you know, we want to fix everything. So I hope we're coming to COP and continuing to come to COP that some real good, solid, positive outcomes will come out for our children and our daughters of the deep. 
Thank you very much. Oh, and I would like also to acknowledge our our partners, our previous partners, our new partners. I know I can see a lot of partners here um, that it will help us in the Pacific, but also to SPREP and to the Pacific Climate Change Center for allowing me to be their voice today. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you very much, and congratulations for the work you are you are doing. It's uh, it's source of inspiration to see uh, how you are also involved in the, the very young uh, generation. Thank you very much. Uh, you underlined the fact that uh, all of this will cost a lot of money, so it's a perfect transition for our next and final uh, speakers, Mr. Salomon Asamoa, who is the CEO of the Ghana Infrastructure Investment Fund. And so, um, of course, that's always the, the, the big question, and uh, especially for a mayor or at very local level, it's always extremely difficult to access some funds. And so uh, we want to know how, at a more national or regional level, some banks are uh, trying to address those, uh, those uh, issues and work with uh, uh, mayors and uh, local elected. So thank you. Thank you, very, thank you very much, and thank you for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here. As mentioned, I'm the CEO of the Ghana Infrastructure Investment Fund, uh, based in Accra. Um, and this is a fund that was created by the government. Government initially gave us $250 million to focus on infrastructure projects within Ghana. Since the time that they gave us that fund, we've doubled it now to almost half a billion dollars. And we've done about a dozen infrastructure projects uh, within Ghana. Um, the, probably the key thing that I should bring across is that for every dollar that we've put into an investment in Ghana in infrastructure. We've managed to raise $10 of other sources of money to complement our money. So our money is like uh, an anchor, and we leverage it to raise funding from the other side. So we have a very good sense of what private sector or other sources of funds needs to see before they write a check. Um, so I'll give you some of the experiences for that. Now, the first thing I need to say is that you need to know the sources of finances or sources of capital that you're looking for, what their requirements are. So many of this adapt adaptation um, on the coastal areas, unfortunately, is not directly revenue generating. So it's going to be very difficult to get pure private sector financiers who are looking for returns on their money to fund those type of uh, uh, activities. However, you do have sources of capital around the world that is directly interested in funding this. But what you need to do, or what we need to do, is to put a structure in place by which they can feel comfortable that the funds that they will give to these, uh, these, the, the, these, these users, um, although they may not need to be repaid, they need to show that effectively they're solving the problem that they're identified for. And unfortunately, nice words and uh, social pressures don't always release those types of funding. So we have to have hard discussions about how those funds are structured, who manages them, what sort of activities they get involved in. And many of these um, donor funds are obviously public taxpayers' money. And so they also have to report back on exactly how these funds are being used. So what we found in Ghana was that for, for, for many of the activities that we did, we did a new airport, we did an expansion of uh, the second port in the country. Um, we're doing road projects now. All of these, we have to make conditions uh, within the, the, the contractors and the people doing the work to identify the, um, the resilience that they need to put into the new infrastructure. Now, when you speak to many of these contractors, they understand, but they don't really care that much. Um, and, and the cost the additional cost is something that they usually do not like to bear. So that's the source of donor, money, donor funding or grant funding to complement um, the funding to make sure that from a private sector perspective, they will still get their rest those returns. Now, there's been a lot of discussions about blended capital, and that is one of the areas I used to work at, IFC um, and the African Development Bank, so I'm very familiar with this. Um, so we need to structure sources of grant money to complement um, the other sources of money to make it attractive um, for private sector and unlock the capital to come into these areas. Um, the other point that I would, I would, I would make is that philanthropic uh, organizations, life officers, 
are very, very keen in this particular area. They want to be associated uh, with these type of activities. And I always stress to people that never underestimate the power of a powerful example that has been done properly, because you can use that example to then tap into many, many sources of, of funding. But it's that first couple of examples that we need to spend our time really making sure that we get it right. Um, so for example, in Ghana, we are doing, there's, there's a shortage of university student accommodation, real shortage. We've created the first pilot that we've did in the country that is totally green and sustainable. Solar, recycled water, off the grid, highly sustainable. We did the first pilot with our own funds. We now have a line of um, uh, institutions looking to fund us to do the, com the, the next set. We tried to do something in our port areas to make it resilient. We showed the example, and we are now attracting other sources of people to come and replicate what we've done. So I think uh, I will end there. Um, the point I'm trying to make is that the sources of financing we need to make an argument to them that suits their requirements for providing financing. And then I think there's a lot of appetite to get involved in this kind of um, uh, resilient infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was, uh, it was passionating uh, listening to you. And uh, maybe uh, one final question for, uh, for all of you. Uh, Briefly, in one minute, if, for example, by the end, let's be optimist, if by the end of the, of the COP in the loss and damage fund, we can have a one billion or two billion or two or three, and maybe also in another fund for adaptation to, be, to make the best use of, uh, of this money, how would, you, how would you spend it? Maybe we can start uh, with you. One billion. <laughs> nice. Um, um, <laughs> I think, as I said at the beginning, I think um, a showcase project that really demonstrates how you can help protect the most vulnerable in the, the communities in the, is the one that I think will wish to be replicated. So I would say in our particular area in Ghana, um, we're having a lot of challenges with flooding uh, and it's affecting the poor communities. So if we can identify and structure a project that can solve that issue, then I think we can replicate it in other places. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hard question also. <laughs> For me, it could be, I think, it, two elements. First of all, to consider that uh, adaptation is not a cost, but an investment, first of all. And the second point is to develop an uh, international platform for to share in platform, to share in knowledge, information, to drive the most adaptation strategy for all uh, countries without, uh, uh, um, and I would say that, the, the, uh, with, um, without to be paid. Yeah. So, uh, uh, an international platform, uh, a software, free, without cost, and for everyone and everywhere. That's all. Thank you. Um, I think I'll build a bridge from our islands to the biggest country that have produced this problem, I will build a bridge. But in actual fact, I think infrastructure is very important for us. So I obviously would hopefully can build another island that we can escape to. But um, you know, getting all these millions, I, I understand we talk about the finances. It's very difficult for us. So we can talk about billions and billions of dollars. Reality for us is it's very, very difficult. So I'm very optimistic that after this COP, with your help, that I'll be getting part of the billion dollars for my people. <laughs> Building my, the lives of my, our people on the islands is important. So this money will greatly be appreciative. And thank you in advance. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> So um, thank you. I, I would uh, then add uh, a component um, to uh, include uh, first to further observe the ocean. So to strengthen the and sustaining the current observing system, then also to invent more uh, in research and in research of development that the knowledge we have, which is very much often um, focused on the open ocean, will have more information on the coastal areas and reduce the uncertainties, as you just added at the end of my uh, intervention. Then uh, to think about a global a framework where we can all work together to learn from each other, to share capacities, 
for implementing the best adaptation solutions and the climate resilient pathways. And um, I forgot the final one I wanted to say. <laughs> <laughs> it was a good one. Well, thank you very much. Thank you to all our panelists. Thank you for those uh, inspireful ideas. And uh, we are we will now running a bit out of time. So I let the floor to Lorelai again. Thank you very much, all of you. Thank you so much. Congratulations. Uh, it was indeed very, you're very tall. Um, it was indeed very inspiring. And to hear that, of course, there is no one size fits all type of solution, that there are some really harsh realities as well. Uh, sinking cities, we're talking about people. You said that as a mother, we want to fix it. I think it's a woman's thing. We're trying to fix it. So we need also more women in delegations. Just saying it out. <laughs> but we need to act as a community. It's a global response that we need. And we need global uh, financing mechanism as well. We understand that there are scientific uncertainties that we can address, and uh, we look forward to the UN Decade of Ocean Science events in Barcelona as well uh, in April 2024, where we will be also organizing another uh, discussion on these, uh, on these topics. So thank you so much. And um, now it's, it's time to, to close this great event as well, and it's uh, our pleasure to have with us um, Ruth Bumfrey, you're the Chief Executive Officer of Lloyd's Register Foundation, which is a global safety um, charity with a mission to engineer a safer world. That is quite the mission, um, so thank you. <laughs> As we have heard, you know, we need about a billion dollars in one week, so you know, how can you help us doing this? But we also knew that um, social justice is at the very core of everything that you do, so we're delighted to have you here. We're very grateful for your support, and uh, I know of reputation how much uh, the Lloyds Foundation has done for the ocean uh, community in general, so it's a pleasure to give you the floor for final remarks. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you so much for those very generous words, Laurelie, and, um, and, and a fascinating panel. You know, I, th I think none of us can go away from here without being affected by um, the, the lived experience that we heard about today. You know, in the Seychelles, uh, Mona, you're, you're very powerful, talking about the Daughters of the Deep, and the way that we're having to teach our children about the future that they need to um, prepare themselves for. Um, in the Lloyd's Register Foundation, um, we've been around for a, a long time. Um, uh, we've always thought about this life, life matters, and the safety of life and property. Um, infrastructure is a hidden part of what keeps us alive. And that's something, you know, in Infrastructure Day here um, and, and in the panel, this is, this is an important thing for us. Uh, we, we don't live without our infrastructure. We don't live without engineering. But that engineering and the systems we create have to be people-centered. They have to protect people's way of lives, their livelihoods, the economies of, of, of the areas they live, and be locally led and, and respond to local, local issues. So, so it, uh, it's our strong belief in the foundation everyone deserves to, f to feel safe and to be safe. And you, and, you, and you understand from what you hear today that people don't feel safe and they aren't going to be safe. And that's a long-term problem. Um, we've heard you know, a, a amazing things here. Uh, about, um, about the science, you know, a stark warning from, from Corinne that this is not a reversible thing. This isn't going to reverse in, in, in our life, lifespans or the lifespans of our children or our grandchildren. This isn't a reversible thing. Um, we need to accept um, that this is going to happen, uh, accept the uncertainty and the diverse pathways. Um, and we need to act now uh, in a people-centered way. You know, these are strong messages coming across. Um, we need to prepare the next generation. All of us need to prepare the next generation. And Solomon, you know, you gave a masterclass in um, raising money, you know, in how, to, in how to raise money. And as a foundation, you know, we have limited resources and, our, and we think our best resources are going into helping other people to raise money, actually, because you have to speak the language. You have to, to speak the language of the investment funds. And, and that's an important skill to teach out. In the foundation, um, We've got a couple of things that we're working on at the moment. You know, we, we've, we, we um, are working on the transition pathways uh, in infrastructure needed for the mitigation, uh, but we're also working on the adaptation, on the resilience, on the resilience engineering that is needed. Uh, we funded many big programs around this. Um, we are um, thinking, of, we're putting an engineering person into the Ocean Decade team. 
in order to extract the science and the knowledge which is coming out of the Ocean Decade team and to try and put it into scalable action. And when we think about scalable action, what are the pathways, shared pathways, shared methods, shared standards, and shared educational uh, education that we need to be teaching to the next generation of engineers and planners? Because it needs to be different, and it hasn't changed in 30, 40 years. These methods haven't changed. So we need to be teaching the next generation of engineers and planners how to do things in a different way. And we're supporting nature positive engineering. You know, Solomon, you said the power of a good example. There's probably, you know, 10,000 examples of good nature positive engineering, but they haven't been translated into codes and practices that can be picked up and used every time we have to reinvent something new, and, that, and it shouldn't be like that. But what, what I want to finish on um, is just to pick up what Mona said at the end, that we, as mothers, we want to fix everything. And um, when I came to my first COP, I thought, what am I doing here? You know, this is, um, it feels like an unsolvable problem. And, and where's the optimism? And I want to put some optimism. And I took that back to my partner. And my partner said, he, he used to come to the front door with the team and, and wave us goodbye every day <laughs> and say, go out and change the world. He did a different kind of job. And he was very proud of us for, for being here and changing the world. He said, it's like you're putting on a tug of war. You know, you, you've got a rope and you're, you've got all your hands on this rope. And sometimes if you let go of the rope, it still keeps going. You think, well, what am I doing here? You know, why am I, why am I here? Why am I pulling us in this direction? But it's important that we're all here and important that we're all pulling in the same direction. So I want to thank you. Uh, that we can fix this. We can fix this. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that was a perfect way to uh, end our event as well. I want to take a few minutes, of course, to thank all of our amazing panelists, our uh, high-level opening remarks, closing remarks, and you know, we, we are all in this together, for sure. And we need to act all together. And I also want to take a minute to thank all of our partners with the CTS projects, because with the policy recommendations that we have released, we have been endorsed by more than 80 organizations across the globe that genuinely believe that we can actually solve that crisis. So we have one week left to make COP28 count. It is the most important COP since COP21. It's the first ever global stock take. The ocean needs to be part of that global response. We are at the crossroads of all challenges facing humanity today. So let's, you know, the ocean is rising, but so is its community. We count on you and thank you very much.